Jordy mentioned that there's going to be a panel. And um, we're going to do this league style. And our league has learned that if people write out their questions, um, it gives more people, shy people, an opportunity to get their questions answered <laughs> to begin with. And we find oftentimes it takes people a long time to get their question out. And so what we do is we take all the questions to one point, we check for duplicates, and sometimes you can combine them and all that kind of thing. And we're going to be doing that. So as you listen to our four presenters this morning, and if you have questions, just jot them down on the piece of paper. We're going to be screening them up here. And there are league members in the audience. League members, if you're there, raise your hand. If you see them at your table, just give your questions to them and then bring them up to this table, or you can bring them up at any time. And then we will present them to the, um, Beth is going to, um, to narrate that, that part of the, um, the program. As Jordy said, as you could see what, what happened with the conference in, uh, in Cedar Rapids, this is kind of an expression of that same kind of desire. What can we do to understand the problems? And in this case, we're talking about the Upper Mississippi watershed. What role do we play? you know, in our own backyards, on our own yard, in uh, our farms, in our communities, and so on. And what can we do to collaborate to then work on fixing them and facing those challenges? And that's the purpose of today, much like that conference. Um, so Jordy did, talked about that whole Mississippi River Basin. Now we are kind of just getting down into the upper Mississippi River Basin, which is m the majority of five states, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Iowa, and a little part of Missouri. And the League of Women Voters, when we were working on this, thought, gee, we have leagues in all four of those states. And we have now got 60 leagues in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Illinois, focusing on these water issues. And we're going to talk more about why the league then started working with the Rotaries because we thought, gosh, this is another great opportunity to bring two civic-oriented, structured, accountable, trusted organizations in all of our states together to work on these issues too. So start thinking along those lines of our, our, you know, our ongoing partnership. So now we're down to the Upper Mississippi River Basin. And our next speaker is going to be talking about her huge job in the state of Illinois. And if you think about all that long, 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 long Mississippi River border of Illinois, it gives you some idea of the hugeness of her uh, job. Amy Wachenbach began her career at Illinois EPA in 1987. She prim primarily oversees the non-point source program. And for those of you who might not know the difference between point source and non-point source, we are looking at the sources of pollution. With point source, it might be a particular factory. It may be a sewage disposal plant. You know, we know where it is entering the water. Non-point source is all the kinds of stuff running off our backyards and our farm fields and you know all those other land uses. So just think about the immensity of her, her job in overseeing that program. Um, and she is also the, uh, implementing the Il Illinois Nutrient Reduction Strategy. And that is one of the things that the League has learned that all four of our states have in common. Each state has developed a nutrient loss strategy, and Amy is going to tell us more about that uh, so we can, again, figure out how are we going to spread the word, grow the collaboration, and focus on action to raise the grade in our area. So, Amy? Oh, there, there you are. Okay, welcome, and thank you. My boss about a raise. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, ultimately. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, let's see while I get this going. Bonnie, thank you very much. Jordy, thank you very much. You guys set the stage perfectly for me to talk about what we're doing in Illinois. Um, and also to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the policy we have in Illinois now and how you can implement that policy at a local level. Great, okay. So um, I'm gonna talk about the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy, as Bonnie indicated. Um, we've got other, all the other Mississippi states um, in the Upper Miss have a strategy um, similar to ours, but ultimately different in that we've got different issues in, in the states. The webpage, um, please go look at the webpage, see all the exciting things we've got going on because I'm not gonna be able to touch on those today. Um, so this, I'm gonna go back in history a little bit, kind of set the stage. Um, so back in the early 2000s, we were, were really looking at the Mississippi River as you know, what's going on, how can we start protecting it? Um, also, how can we start protecting Gulf hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico? So really what I'm gonna talk about today is a think globally, act locally type of initiative. Um, we want to protect the Gulf of Mexico, but it's really hard sometimes to think in those perspectives. How is what I'm doing in my backyard affecting the Gulf of Mexico? So what we're gonna do is try to impact our local environment, and that is ultimately gonna have a very big impact on the Gulf of Mexico. Um, you can see this is the same watershed that Jordy was showing. If you can see in the bottom um, left-hand corner, that map has the Gulf hypoxic zone identified. It looks relatively small when you think about the Mississippi River Basin, but it's the size of Connecticut. And I think if the United States ever said, you know what, we're gonna give up Connecticut to the ocean. Um, I think we'd have a lot, of, a lot of people that would fight back on that. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to fight back to regain the, the dead zone in the Gulf. Okay, so back in 2008, and I kind of um, brushed over that, we had the Gulf Hypoxia Action Plan that had been developed, was um, presented to Congress, and ultimately set out a 45% reduction in nutrients. That would be phosphorus and nitrogen um, to the Gulf of Mexico in order to regain that dead zone area it, or at least a, a, a greater portion of it. Um, I think I've got, yeah. During the process of developing that, that action plan, USGS did a, a survey and did some extensive modeling that showed Illinois was the number one contributor of both phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, so we've got a great big target on us. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, if you're a half glass half full, glass half empty person, um, Illinois is extremely diverse. We have a large amount of agricultural land that's going to um, help hurt this situation. But we also have extremely high urban areas, specifically Chicago, but we also have East St. Louis, we also have Rockford, Bloomington, Peoria, that are contributing significant amount of um, effluent through both the wastewater treatment plants and our factories. Um, and industry. So we've got this big target and so we've, we're really having to address that situation. And, and I think the state of Illinois and all the participants have been more than eager to say, yes, we need to do our part. The strategy, um, I will let you read this. Um, it's just a, a, you know, what we're looking at with the strategy, but we are looking at both point sources and non-point sources. So very different approaches to both of those. And we get into a little gray area when we talk about non-point source, your, your runoff, because that also includes stormwater. 
And a lot of stormwater in our um, municipal areas is actually a permitted activity. So the agency, Illinois EPA, does have the ability to ratchet down on some of those stormwater activities. But in our more rural areas and communities, um, it becomes entirely voluntary to our, in our approaches to addressing non-point sources. Our policy working group members, so after the 2008 report came out, in 2009, US EPA submitted a memo to all the states um, entitled the Stoner Memo. Um, got a lot of chuckles through the years. But it set out a path for the states to develop their nutrient loss reduction strategies. Uh, when Illinois EPA and Illinois Department of Agriculture came together, said this is you know, something we've got to address, we put together a policy working group. This working group is, and it is, is still um, engaged today, it is made up of a very balanced group of people. We are looking at um, environmentalists, we've got academics, we've got um, ag industry, and we have um, urban, uh, both industry and urban um, stormwater, wastewater treatment plant types on this group. So extremely diverse, uh, we worked very hard to make it um, level, so every, no vote would be able to um, override any one particular group. So fast forward to 2015, we worked very hard with this policy working group to come up with our nutrient loss reduction strategy. It does set forth um, a 45% reduction in nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen. It gives us an in interim milestone that we are looking at meeting in 2025 um, with a 25% reduction in phosphorus and a 15 in nitrogen. Um, we do look at all sectors that I'm talking about, the point sources, the urban storm water, as well as the uh, ag non-point source. Okay, now I'm going to back up a little bit to how we got to that point of developing the strategy. Our first effort was to um, contract with the University of Illinois and develop a science advisory team. Uh, you can see the members listed here. Um, very well respected uh, individuals that are knowledgeable in water resources as well as um, water quality and characterizing the water quality in Illinois and in Illinois watersheds. They use data from the agency as well as many other sources to come up with what are nutri nutrient impacts to the Mississippi River Basin are, or were at that time. I'm hoping they're less at this point. Um, so you can see for total nitrogen and, and nitrates, um, the, the green portion is your agricultural inputs. So you're at about 80, 82% for nitrogen with um, the red being point sources. And point sources really primarily are going to be wastewater treatment plants um, at 16, 18%. But when you look at phosphorus, it's um, really about a half and half input um, between the agricultural sources and your um, point sources. Urban stormwater is very minimal. We're looking at, at 2%. Um, or, 2% on each nitrate and total nitrogen, 4% on, on phosphorus. So about a 4% on both nutrients um, for, for our urban sources. But still extremely important in some areas. If you're in an urban area, 4% is going to be extremely important. And so we are still addressing those. Um, for our strategy, we are really in the, in the near term focusing on um, phosphorus reductions in our wastewater treatment plants and nitrogen reduction on our agricultural lands with some phosphorus reduction seen on our, agri or our um, soybean acres. And Jean, I'm not going to steal too much of your thunder because you've got a lot of good stuff to say. 
Okay, through the science advisory uh, committee, they also developed um, yield maps for us so we could start to see where we were losing um, our, our, our nutrients and what areas we might want to focus on the most. So here for nitrogen, you're looking at um, point sources here on the right, non-point sources on the left. Nothing really um, astounding to us. I think anybody working in the industry for a while would be able to pinpoint where we are seeing those losses. Same thing for phosphorus, point sources on the right, non-point sources on the left. And you will see um, for the non-point sources, there is a difference between phosphorus and nitrogen based on where you have primarily tile drain fields. Using that information, information we gathered from the policy working group, um, we developed priority watersheds. These are areas that um, we want to focus measuring our um, successes in. So to develop these or to determine which are our priority watersheds, we were looking at the total loads that were being lost from these watersheds. We were looking at local water quality so if you had really pristine water quality in a watershed or really, really crappy uh, water, those would not get a higher priority because what we're looking for for our early successes is where can we change water quality pretty quickly. So the water quality is bad, but we think we can save it pretty quickly. We'll work on that higher for at a, at a later date. Um, and then we also were looking at watershed planning. Where do we know we have active citizen participation? Where do we have plans in place? Where can we hit the ground running? Now this isn't to say that any, any watershed in the state is not a priority to us. It is indeed, and it will remain a priority to us. But what it does is it gives us areas where we can start measuring those successes without having to look at all 153 watersheds every two years when we're looking at successes. We can look at the state and then we can look at our priority watersheds and show our, our successes. Through the development of the strategy, we developed a lot of work groups um, that are continually meeting. Um, so I'll get back to those in a minute. Well, okay, go ahead and start with the urban stormwater. Um, as I said, this, this sector is only 4% of the input to the Mississippi River watershed, but it is extremely important to local water quality. So if you're in an urban area, if you have, you know, some pretty um, significant stormwater issues, um, non-point source issues, then you are going to see some very impacted local water quality problems. This is where we're seeing a lot of the algal blooms, the harmful algal blooms. Um, so we aren't focusing this effort so much on downstream impacts, but we are focusing it on the local impacts. Um, you can read the charge. Um, this particular charge to the group is pretty benign. Um, We've got some regulatory programs in place. We're hoping US EPA can help us um, strengthen our stormwater programs at the state level. So for now, the, the charge to the group is to really work with education and outreach activities in urban areas to help um, public works directors, mayors, um, village presidents, um, those sorts understand the impact of stormwater and what it has on their local water quality. So that's what we're working on now. We meet a couple times a year. Um, we are leveraging everybody's different organization's ability to implement projects. The Ag Water Quality Partnership Forum and the subsequent technical subwork group um, the, the charge here, it's, um, it's a little bit bigger charge, um, but it's coordinating the efforts of everyone working in, in the agricultural fields. 
Um, Gene has in in the later or the next the next speaker has a lot of information on what's going on. Um, I have to commend the Ag Water Quality Partnership Forum and all those um, industries and down to the individual farmers that are working to address the nutrient loss reduction strategy. This is an absolutely voluntary portion of the strategy. We have identified things that people can do, but it's voluntary. If they don't do it, we can't do anything about it. Um, I had a farmer this year call and ask me, can I put on anhydrous right now? Is it cold enough yet? I'm like, ah, I haven't looked at the soil temperatures, that's not really my job, but hey, that was a total turnaround for that particular farmer. I have known this person for a long time. He got it, he heard the message that what you're doing is not healthy for the environment. So he was asking questions and, you know, Gene, I commend you so much, that's awesome. Um, probably the big thing here is tracking BMP implementation, best management practices. What is happening on the ground? It's a very difficult thing for us to track. Uh, we don't know what individual farmers are doing, individual landowners are doing. Uh, we need a way to track that, and this policy work group is working on a method to get that information collected, coalesced, and then brought back to the policy work group so we can indeed promote our successes. These uh, best management practices that are up here, these are the ones that were specifically identified in the nutrient loss reduction strategy document. Um, it doesn't mean they are the end all by any means, but these are the ones where we have data, we have shown that they do have a significant impact on um, loss of nutrients from ag lands. And so these are the ones that we are actively promoting there are others. There are others that we're looking at um, doing additional research on so that maybe we can add them to our you know, active BMPs, active demonstration BMPs. But we are not discouraging anyone from doing something. You have to do something. Um, these are just the ones that we know we can, we have the research behind them. The Nutrient Monitoring Council charge. If you happen to look at the, the document, the, the strategy document, their charge was, again, relatively benign, um, a couple sen sentences, sentences. Well, when the council got to, together, it was, it's, or it is, made up of several scientists. Uh, I wanna say there's 14 scientists on this committee or this council. And if you've ever worked with scientists, they're really wordy. <laughs> so they took, they took the charge that was given to them and they said, ah, this isn't good enough. We gotta get more specific. We are going to rewrite the charge. And I know at least the first two meetings were primarily to rewrite the charge. But what they did is they set out a road, road map for them to help them move through the process of monitoring water quality and indeed helping us show our successes. So again, you can read that, but um, the first one looking at a five year running average so that they can start, they have a baseline, they wanna continue that baseline and be able to report every five years what's going on on you know, what's leaving the state of Illinois and indeed impacting the Gulf of Mexico, Mississippi River. Um, they're looking at what's leaving the priority watersheds using a baseline that was developed in the strategy. Um, again, not that they're a priority for implementation more than any other watershed, but those are the ones that we're selecting to measure our successes. Um, identify statewide priority watershed trends, statewide and priority watershed trends. So what's the trend? Are we indeed getting better or staying the same or heaven forbid getting worse? 
And then they want to document local water quality outcomes, um, specifically for the priority watersheds, but also for watersheds, smaller watersheds, with either within those priority watersheds or other smaller watersheds that are doing some intensive work. Um, Lake Springfield is doing some very intensive work in their very small, and if you're familiar with watershed language, they're very small 12-digit um, watershed. Um, where we can hope to see some pretty immediate results. And so the Nutrient Monitoring Council wants to be able to work with those watersheds and use those as successes again, but also so that other watersheds can say, okay, I see what, hap what they did in this watershed, that's a small enough watershed that I can make a difference. I can help implement activities um, and then replicate those in your watershed. And then develop a list of nutrient monitoring activities and associated funding. So basically what needs to happen and how much money and the how much money is really the big bottom line. Uh, monitoring is expensive and so in order to be able to justify additional resources going into monitoring, they're going to have to come up with a plan and what that dollar amount is. Uh, you can't take a plan and say, please fund this if you don't have a budget associated with it. So they'll be working on that. One of the big things they have done, um, and it really was um, something that we didn't expect would happen this quickly, is they were able to, the council was able to partner with my agency, Illinois EPA, as well as USGS, to get eight super gauges placed at the pore point, so the bottom of, the, of major basins, where water is leaving and leaving the state of Illinois. These super gauges um, monitor not just water level and but it, they also monitor dissolved oxygen, phosphorus, and nitrogen. They monitor it on a continuous basis. Every 15 minutes, we have a reading of how much phosphorus is leaving several of our major basins. Um, so you can see up there, we've got 90% of the state covered. We're gonna be able to document then the water quality on a very large basin level leaving the state and seeing where, again, our successes are. We're working, um, we, the, the council is working also to get a ninth gauge downstream of Chicago so we can measure the, the changes that Chicago is making in their wastewater treatment facilities um, as it comes out of Chicago. Um, so far, additional monies are needed and we are hopeful that they can be found here relatively quickly. Okay, our benchmark committee. This is the committee that's gonna keep us on track to meeting our interim goals as well as our final goal of 45%. Right now, the benchmark committee is focusing on point sources and measuring, um, putting together point source baselines and looking at where we are since those original baselines were, were developed. So once we get the point sources kind of figured out, then we're gonna use hopefully the same um, methods and come up with then the ag, the ag milestones to get to our interim milestones. Our Nutrient Science Advisory Committee, this committee was de developed as part of the document. It was also um, kind of one of the edicts from US EPA is that we will develop water quality standards for nutrients um, in the very near future. So we selected um, five scientists. The scientists were selected, well they were first nominated by each of the sectors within the policy work group. Um, they nominated different scientists that they would like to see on this, this committee. And then we went through interview processes um, and then narrowed it down to five scientists that were agreeable by everyone. We also have a representative from US EPA on this committee. Um, in order for us to know that US EPA is you know, with us along this whole march to come up with um, water quality standards for nutrients. 
The committee's been meeting for about a year and a half now. They are still collecting or compiling all the data sources that they have. They've been started running scenarios um, and doing modeling and I sit in on the calls and the statistics they talk about are so far <laughs> above my head that, you know, what they're trying to do is get to the point where they can make a correlation with the amount of nutrients to impairments in water quality. So they're having to run variations of all these scenarios with nutrients and with dissolved oxygen, um, looking at our aquatic life, when is it impacted, and that's not just micro or um, macro invertebrates, but it's also our fisheries. Combining all of those and all the variables, um, so they're working very hard. They're, they're having at least monthly calls um, to discuss their findings. They are tasked with having a recommendation to the agency in November of this year. Um, at that point, the agency will take their recommendation. Um, it may be that they have one number for phosphorus and, well, there definitely would be a number for phosphorus and a number for nitrogen. It may be a statewide number. It may be a uh, basin number, maybe a watershed number. You know, you may have different numbers for different parts of the state. That is all yet to be determined, but they're working very hard on that. Showing progress. Um, these are just some of the things that we'll be using to show our progress, show our success and implementation of the strategy. And we will be reporting on our progress. Um, we are right now um, struggling with developing our first uh, report on this, the, the success and the implementation of the document. Uh, it will be out two years in July. Uh, I'm hopeful we can meet a July 2017 report deadline. Um, it's possible we may end up, it's very bureaucratic, we may end up in the fall, I'm not sure, but um, what we're trying to do, and this is the difficulty with the first report, is how can we replicate this report every two years? Uh, and everyone knows the staff constraints that we're seeing in, in state government. How can we do that under reduced staff? Um, so that's, that's the difficulty of this, this first report because we have an abundance of data. All our sectors and all the organizations re representing each of the sectors are giving us data. Here's what we're doing. Here's how many people we're impacting. Here's um, water quality data. Um, so getting all of that into a useful document um, we're working on daily. So again, um, this is the web page for our strategy. Um, I invite you to please go out, look at it. All the agendas and all the meeting minutes are out there. We also have any presentations that have been given at the meetings. They are out there as well. All these meetings are open to the public with the exception of the Nutrient Science Advisory Committee. Those meetings are closed because it is, at this point, an intellectual committee, and therefore um, many of their ideas and, and um, discussions have to be kept confidential at this point, although they do report back to the policy work group um, every time the policy work group meets. They also, you will see on the web page, uh, next steps for that um, committee. So if you are interested in the water quality standards aspect of it, there are next steps, so we, we aren't completely closing it. It's just those intellectual deliberations are kept confidential at this point. So with that, I thank you. take a 15 minute coffee break. I have almost 20 after, so if we can make it closer to 10 minutes, it would be good. And I just think this is such an opportunity to think about the very hard working state employees that are doing this absolutely great work on our behalf 
And so often, I don't think the people who work for us in government get the credit that's due. And so I want to say, Amy, thank you. I wish we could give you the credit due. So, um, so please put your questions up here. Go to the bathroom, get your coffee, and we'll see you back here in 10 minutes. <laughs>